Route 66 Diner, Celebrity Watering Hole, Beat Generation Artists Hangout, and Counterculture Rock and Roll Refuge. Barney's Beanery has been a Hollywood icon for almost 90 years. Yeah, Barney's is the first restaurant I ever came to when I first came to Los Angeles. A friend of mine said, oh, this is one place i got to take you right now, and it was here. Um, I've been coming to Barney's since I moved to Los Angeles about 17 years ago. I don't know that it's changed that much. You meet new people, old regulars come back. It's really Barney's is so much about the people who come in here. And I, you know, they come back for the familiarity of it. So I think it's, it's a great thing that it hasn't changed that much. John Barney Anthony started his original beanery in Berkeley in 1920. But he missed the warmer climate of his native Los Angeles and relocated the beanery to a little shack on Santa Monica Boulevard in 1927 on a stretch of road soon to become part of the legendary Route 66. At the time that Barney's Beanery first was on Santa Monica Boulevard as a sort of a shack, uh, the local area around here was all poinsettia fields. It was really like developed. It was only in the like mid-1920s that the very first colonial buildings went up on the Sunset Strip. The restaurant's popularity was a direct reflection of Barney's own personality. He was a businessman with a kind heart and often extended credit in the form of IOUs. Just a, a regular Joe, you know, a, a, and a good Joe to top it off. Barney had a heart of gold. He'd look at me so often, he said, go over there and eat a hamburger. And I said, well, I can't afford it, Barney. He says, go eat a hamburger, I'll take care of it. I had a heart of gold. That's all I've ever heard. A great example is the license plate thing. We have these license plates above the bar, and some of them, are, you'll see them, they're really, really old. And in the first decade in which this restaurant was open was the Depression, the Dust Bowl. There were a lot of people coming from different parts of the country and coming away from hard times. There was a couple years when they were building Route 66 out that Route 66 literally ended in front of the restaurant. People were coming to Los Angeles to start a new life and they, they literally ended here, sometimes with no money, and they would leave their license plate as collateral for, for their meal. And sometimes they came back and paid their tab and sometimes they didn't, but he, he wanted this to be a place that people felt comfortable coming into no matter where they were from, no matter how much money they had in their pocket. The Hollywood Filmland community was attracted to the Beanery's laid-back roadhouse atmosphere early on. Barney's first official movie star customer was Monty Blue. 1920s screen goddess Clara Bow and the great John Barrymore also became regulars. Well, in the in 1920s and 1930s, you know, the early days of Clark Gable and, and Gene Harlow and the classic Hollywood, you know, golden era, as we will call it, they came here when they were on their way up. And Clark Gable even had some IOUs up there in the box. Celebrity or not, Barney treated everyone the same. You don't get that great big smile when you're up, and you don't get the brush off when you're down. Firmly entrenched as a celebrity hangout, the post-World War II beanery hosted some classic Hollywood hijinks. The 1950 Mickey Awards, a hilarious send-up of the Academy Awards, was sponsored by none other than Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Barney was on hand to present some of the awards himself. And rolled up the red carpet when the party was over. After World War II, Los Angeles had a great period of prosperity. One of the most important parts of Barney's Beanery was that this became a home for the artists of the Ferris Gallery era. Wallace Berman, Billy Al Bankston, Ed Ruscha, and Andy Warhol had his very first show in 1962 right here in La Cienega. This was the place where all these people would come. That was, that was a standard line. If there's a flash grease fire at Barney's, the whole modern art movement in California would be kaput. Barney was really nice. I mean, for a restaurateur, he was majestic. I mean, he was really cool. It was friendly. It was peaceful. Uh, camaraderie existed. The, the concept of fame was about the last thing in the world that any of us cared about. 
Artist Ed Keenholz got a lot more than 15 minutes of fame with his 1965 assemblage sculpture, The Beanery. The occupants all have clock faces, most of them set at 10-10 to resemble eyebrows. Barney's the only person with his own head on his shoulders. The whole thing symbolizes going from real time to surrealist time inside the bar, where people waste time, lose time, escape time, ignore time, Keenholz said, complete with sounds and smells of the original beanery. The 22-foot-long walk-in version made its debut in Barney's parking lot before being sent to the Duan Gallery in New York. I don't know if it's art, Keenholz said, but I don't give a damn. By the mid-60s, the Sunset Strip was the epicenter of the exploding L.A. rock music scene. Clubs like Ciro's hosted the Birds, joined on stage one night by Bob Dylan. The Whiskey featured some of the best groups at the time, and even had the Doors as its house band for a while. The Troubadour was the venue of choice for the folk rock movement. Barney's was a magnet for an eclectic mix of actors, writers, and musicians. Actor Seymour Cassell recounted introducing poet Charles Bukowski to Johnny Cash in the Beanery. The Doors were regulars at Barney's, and Jim Morrison had the dubious distinction of being 86th for urinating on the bar one night, a spot now celebrated with a plaque in true Hollywood fashion. Janis Joplin was also a regular, and Barney's employees were shocked and saddened to hear that after a typical night of partying at the bar, she was found dead of a heroin overdose at the nearby Landmark Hotel. After Barney Anthony's passing in 1968, Irwin Held acquired the beanery and ran it for almost 30 years, not without some controversy. And our top story tonight is a battle brewing in the city of West Hollywood. The confrontation taking place in West Hollywood. Oh, there's a certain sign in West Hollywood that's causing quite a controversy among members of the gay community. The infamous sign went up in the 40s, reportedly to keep the local authorities off his back after being busted for allegedly allowing immoral activity on the premises. In 1970, gay rights organizations picketed Barney's to have the sign removed. Irwin considered it part of the restaurant's history. Then we're just continuing the tradition of Finney all these years. Nothing more, nothing less. There's no banning of anybody and no discrimination towards anybody or anything. But amid growing controversy... Well, the owners of Barney's Beanery and the West Hollywood City Council have reached an out-of-court settlement. The sign finally came down. Through it all, Barney's reputation as a rock and roll roadhouse was undiminished. It was the hardest work I ever did. I never had more fun at a job in my life. And I think I pro probably never laughed so hard as I did behind this bar. And I had a lot of great customers. Billy Idol would come in. Brian Setzer, of course, was in a lot. One time, I didn't recognize him. He didn't have his pompadour. He wasn't done up to look like a stray cat. And I carded him because he just had such a baby face. And, and it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Gosh, Robert Plant came in a few times. You two came in here very, very early in their career. It was, it was just really fun. A few years later, in the 90s, I believe, Quentin Tarantino wrote Heroes of Our Dogs and part of Pulp Fiction here. When Irwin retired in 1998, David Houston and Avi Fatel acquired the beanery. Knowing the history and, and all that it's been through, it's just really an honor to be able to help carry on that tradition. A new group of people came in and made sure that it was right up to speed. We get more of an interest in vintage as time goes on, and this place has been restored perfectly to the traditions of what Barney's Beanery has always meant from the beginning. Longtime LA DJ Jim Ladd noted, it was more than a watering hole. It was a gathering spot for the rebels, the rockers, the raconteurs, and the misfits we all love to hang out with. Los Angeles is full of places where you gotta, you gotta be on the list. You gotta be successful enough or cool enough to get in there. Barney's Beanery has never been that. Barney's Beanery has always been about, you know, come as you are, come with what you got, and we'll find a spot for you.